please welcome our final speakers of the day, Ashley Steiner, a Dynamics 365 Customer Engagement Administrator, Liz McLennan, a business analyst and consultant, and Merlin Schwege, a partner at Boyer Associates. Today, they will be presenting new sales features. How do I catch up? Please stick around after their session for a live Q&A. We're so happy that you're able to join Dynamics Con. Thank you for voting for our session and a big shout out to all the sponsors that help make this event free. My name is Liz McLennan. I've been working with Dynamics for a little over 10 years. I've had a bunch of different roles as a trainer, as a CRM admin in sales and delivery. And so I have a lot of different expertise and I'm really excited today to share some knowledge with everyone. Awesome. Thanks, Liz. And yeah, really excited to be here today and uh, kind of share this topic with everybody. My name is Ashley Steiner. I'm a Dynamics Serum Administrator um, for Flex Technology Group. Um, I've been working with uh, Dynamics as long as Liz has. We actually started out um, our careers together about 10 years ago at the same company. Um, and I've been an admin uh, for a really long time, a little stint in consulting, um, but really love to work with salespeople and um, really get them onto the system. So excited for this topic today. Yeah, and my name is Merlin Schweiger. Uh, I've been working with the Dynamics platform for about 15 years, um, and I've overlapped with both uh, Liz and Ashley a few times in the past, uh, and I'm also excited to talk about our topic today. Um, so what is our topic? Uh, new sales features. The idea behind this session was, as we, the three of us, uh, have been talking about lots of new features in Dynamics and the, the things that Microsoft has been adding, especially to the sales module over the last couple of years. Um, and the question came up, well, how do you start taking advantage of these things if your if your foundational system isn't set up properly? Like if you don't have the things that you think you ought to have set up, you're not using the system out of the box the way that you want to be using it. Um, and so you might be intimidated about how to, to set up new features or to move into some of the new things. So we thought, well, that might be a great topic that other people would have questions about. Um, so that's our topic today for the new sales features. How do you catch up? Awesome. So the first thing that we have to address and, and kind of be aware of as we work with Dynamics is that things are not going to be perfect. Um, and I think that that's really well said in what Marilyn uh, talked about earlier is that when you're working with uh, Dynamics and you want to roll out some of the new features, if you don't have a good baseline um, for how those are set up today, it's going to create problems uh, in the future. So to kind of uh, recap some of the problems that people have um, in the system, I kind of put them into three different pillars. Um, I categorize them as people, process, and technology. So all of these need to be aligned and work together in order to have a good um, CRM system and then also working with your salespeople. Um, without, if one of these falls away, it's kind of like a tripod. Without one of these legs, your entire implementation is going to um, I don't even want to use the word fail, but it could fail. Um, and it could be really difficult to set up a system to make salespeople successful. So what are the, some of the problems that fall into these pillars? Um, first, we're going to talk about people. Um, so salespeople could potentially see uh, CRM as just a big brother tool. Um, and, and maybe it was set up that way. You know, leaders said, hey, I want to know what my salespeople are doing. I want to know what activities they're up to, if they're busy. Um, and then salespeople view it only in that way as well. Um, and salespeople are not going to use it if they think that it's just a tool to um, track like what they're doing and how they're interacting with their customers. So it's all about perception and how the system was uh, set up for them. Also, maybe you have a group of salespeople who are not used to using technology for organization. I don't know how many salespeople I've talked to that have um, like a book in their back pocket. It's like this little book, uh, leather bound, um, and they write all of their notes in there. Little do they know that that is actually a CRM system. It's just a very antiquated version of a CRM system. So maybe they're not easy, uh, used to using something like a CRM in order to organize themselves. Um, and then they've you know, they've just gotten used to it. Salespeople don't want anything introduced to them that's going to disrupt how they sell today um, or could be seen as a disruption. Um, Outlook was also the first CRM, I like to say, because it kind of organized your contacts and things like that. So it's really hard to move them away from those kinds of systems as well that they're used to. 
And then the, the last one for people, and, and I'd probably say it's the most important, is what's in it for me. This goes back to the big brother one, but really you have to build that use case for how a system is going to make uh, the salesperson's job easier. What are they going to get out of it? Is it going to help them close more deals? Is it going to help them uh, increase their um, sales cycle? You know, is, are they going to be able to close deals faster? You have to be able to set that um, that expectation for them and really help them understand the benefits of how it's going to help them. This also involves training. So maybe they didn't, uh, they don't see the what's in it for me because they didn't get training from the get go. Um, you know, and you have to do ongoing training with salespeople. Um, they are very, um, there are people that like to forget things. So uh, continuously putting um, the new things in front of them or reinforcing the, um, the process is really helpful. So that moves me into my second uh, pillar here, which I, you know, call process. So within process, um, maybe the system wasn't build, uh, built to the sales process that your salespeople use today. And that's going to be a huge mistake. So maybe you went to the sales managers and said, hey, you know, we, you know, the sales manager said, hey, I want all of these fields. I want to know all this stuff about what my salespeople are doing. But it has nothing to do with the way that salespeople actually work. So when you look into building a CRM system, you really want to connect in that sales process and even the sales strategy, because uh, that's how or defines how salespeople, um, how they work, how they engage with their customer and um, and also like how the company is going to invest back into them. And a CRM system is something that uh, can be an investment into the salespeople to make them more productive and better salespeople. Also, this is also brings up operations. So operations need to, needs a lot of data to process customers. However, salespeople don't like to put in that data, <laughs> or maybe it, they see it as a roadblock to closing their deals. So really making sure that um, their process, the way they work, um, and the information they need in order to make the uh, sale quicker and easier is going to be the best overall. And then the last one, I think, is probably the one that hits us all the hardest because this is the one that we have the biggest impact over is technology. So making sure that you are having a good adoption of the core entities is really important for rolling out new features, um, especially because a lot of the new features that come out are built atop, uh, on top of those core entities. And when I say core entity, I mean account, contact, lead, opportunity. I can't say how many companies I've come across that don't use the lead entity because they just don't find a benefit in it. But then they're not able to use new features like scoring, uh, which I know we're going to talk about a little bit later. Um, you can't use some of those new features because you haven't implemented a process to use the technology in a proper way. So, um, so really making sure that you're using those features. Also, maybe you're not using those in um, those fields or those uh, entities in the way uh, that they were intended to be used. And I guess I should probably update my language here, guys. It's called tables now. Um, you don't use them the way that they're intended. So a lot of people have XRM type systems. And so you're kind of building your own company's uh, way of working into the system. So maybe um, I've seen systems where an account is actually a cow because they have to track their cows across, you know, a farm or something like that. So, um, you know, whatever it works for you, you know, however it works for you is fine. But just make sure you always go into those core tables first and um, make sure that you are um, using them um, as they can be intended. Another big one here is data quality. Oh, I can't even say enough about this. I could probably talk for hours about how awful data quality is or like how important it is. Um, the thing that a lot of people miss here is how do you quantify data, like bad data? Um, you need to be able to find out in your organization, your system, what bad data actually is. Put a number to it. You know, these many contacts don't have X information, like a phone number, email. Um, maybe you have so many accounts that don't have contacts. You've got to identify what that means and come up with a solution on how to fix it. But without knowing, you know, salespeople are not going to use a system that has bad data. Um, um, but we need to be able to identify what bad data is. Um, there's also this quote that I heard one time that I think is awesome. And it says it takes one dollar to fix bad data, but it uh, or to create a, to prevent a duplicate, ten dollars to correct a duplicate and one hundred dollars to store a duplicate if it's left untreated. So 
um, think about the the amount of dollars your company is spending um, if you're just not doing anything about those duplicates um, in the beginning. So coming up with a measure to to prevent those is key. And then the last one I have here is missing key features. So kind of like the core um, tables um, that you should be using. I also think that there are a lot of key features in the system that people don't take advantage of. And these are things that have been around, you know, and introduced um, over the last few upgrades of, of Dynamics. But sometimes if you're not using those, it's more difficult to get up to date with the newer things that are coming out, you know, within the last, you know, release or this upcoming release in April, um, because you didn't implement features that are already there. Some of these that I can think of are like calculated and roll up fields, um, the business process flows that really ties into bringing that process into the technology. And so if you're not creating automation there for your salespeople, that can be really difficult. Business rules is another one, um, especially I think of the business rules as taking over for JavaScript. Um, when you can, doesn't do everything that JavaScript can, but that's really helpful because you know that that's gonna be supported technology moving forward. So as Microsoft continues to update the UI, it seems like every wave now they change the UI in some sort of way, those business rules are gonna stay in place and they're not, you're not gonna have an issue with that automation. Other ones that I think are helpful are things like the hierarchy, manager roll-up features, um, embedding Power BI, and then also the posts and the follow records. So I know that the posts in the middle and the timeline um, sometimes get overlooked, but you can really make sure that you're following the right accounts and that can even help with security. Um, so rather than creating a million security roles, maybe you could follow accounts if you needed to have access to them or be able to see them. So um, those are some things that like are there today that I don't think people take full advantage of. Um, the other problem is how do people know about those you know, how do they know that these features are coming out or how to use them? Um, definitely pay attention to blogs, the Microsoft documentation, podcasts, things like that. Um, so I think that goes back into all three of these is how do you know how to fix them? Ashley, you covered so much great stuff there that I want to ask questions and comment on a few things. So my first question is, um, I think salespeople, from what I've seen, are really bad at using activities. Do you can do you guys consider activities a core entity or something that's like optional for a sales team? I would consider it a core table for salespeople. Every organization that I've ever worked at um, and every sales team that I've worked at, as soon as I show the activities and like the setting yourself up for success in the future, like adding to do's, I mean, it's all in how you present it more so than, hey, we're tracking what you're doing. It's more how can the system remind you what you need to do? Um, so I don't know if it's necessarily a core table from like the technology perspective, but it is for the process, I, in my opinion. Yeah, and it ties into so many of the other features that like are actual value adds for salespeople. Like if you and we'll we'll get into the, some of those features later, but like a lot of that depends upon seeing the activity from the salesperson in the system so that it can say oh, you're very active on this opportunity, you're not as active on this opportunity, or these are the other people who are interacting with your customer. If you don't have any of that activity information, it's really difficult for those tools to to add anything back. Yeah. Those are great points. So another thing I want to bring up, Ashley, you talked about data quality um, and kind of the issues or the concerns there. I've always seen that like data quality and user adoption and like the what's in it for me go hand in hand. Because if you're a salesperson and you have a bunch of bad data, crap data, duplicates, whatever, and you're searching, um, you could be putting your, your notes, your activities, your history to multiple like account records or lead records, let's say. Um, but also it's just incredibly frustrating. Like if you get a bunch of duplicates or bad records when you go to search and do something like that just makes people not trust the system, not want to use the system. So I really think it's kind of like the chicken or the egg scenario, like which one do you tackle first? And you kind of have to consider both at the same time and tackle them both at the same time. Otherwise, you know, one is going to impact the other. I agree. And I think that that goes a lot into training as well. Um, like coming up with that strategy before you implement your system, like how do you, what is good data? So not only do you need to quantify bad data, but like, what does good data look like to you? And then making sure that those expectations are um, sent out to the people that are, act are are creating the data. I know a lot of organizations don't let their salespeople create accounts or things like that because they, they don't trust them to put it in correctly. But I think that as long as you set up what those rules are, 
together, um, that can be helpful to helpful too. And then also implementing maybe a um, like another technology on top of that to help reinforce. Yeah, it's not a one size fits all. Like your your duplicate detection rules could be different. Kind of the length of like one is a lead old or one is an account stale, like that can vary drastically from organization to organization or like how much do you allow the salespeople people to access and do. So it's definitely not a one size fits all approach. How do you, so like if you've already implemented though and you're already in a bad situation, do you guys have any ideas on how to like correct it? Cause I have a feeling like a lot of people listening are already going to be <laughs> Merlin's like, go to your section list. A lot of people are going to already have implemented systems and have problems, right? With these things. <laughs> okay. I'll start my I section. Think, I was gonna say, <laughs> actually I give an answer. I mean, I think like adding another system on top of it, I know that's more dollars, but they can be a lot more flexible. Um, sometimes, like you said, every organization is different. So um, adding like a third party on top of the system. Um, and then when it just goes back to, I hate to say it, but to quantify what bad data is and start to pull queries and find out how bad of a problem it is and determine how to fix it from there. Cause I mean, if it's just accounts missing, you know, contacts, or if it's contacts missing emails, there might be ways to fill in that data. So you just have to find out what, what bad data means that's already there. Fair enough. And when you say third parties, you're thinking like data validation or deduping third party tools. Correct. Like an ISV. Yep. Okay. We can move on to my section about what to do about all of this. <laughs> so the first few things I'd like to point out um, are probably applicable to whatever type of team you're working with to deploy CE, but we're taking this out of perspective of you're working with a sales team and you're deploying it for sales. Um, and so the first piece of advice, um, whether it's a new implementation or you're looking to go back and try to adjust, fix things, is to include the actual end users and salespeople in the process. So you, you really need to understand um, whether you're an internal you know, part of the team implementing it or a consultant, what the process is. Like most likely you're not a salesperson yourself. Um, and so you need to do your best to understand what the actual sales process is and include the sales team and the salespeople in your design. Um, so if you don't take that into consideration, it's gonna feel like it's just something being forced upon them either by management or IT typically, and something that's probably not going to be super helpful for their day-to-day -day job. And that's where you're going to get the lacking of, you know, they don't understand what's in it for them um, and kind of causing poor user adoption. Um, now, if you don't have a sales process, I, I've worked with a lot of companies that don't really have a consistent sales process, and a lot of salespeople do, uh, do this process differently. Um, that's kind of a step you need to take then before you think about how you want the system to work. So the system can do whatever process you want it to do, you need to define that ahead of time. Um, so that's definitely pre-work you can work on if, if you don't have a process defined internally. Um, and you need a sales process. If you don't have one, we highly encourage you to have a sales process. And it's been proven that it'll help salespeople sell more. Um, and certain strategies work and others don't. It just depends on the type of business you're in. So while we're talking about processes, I want to talk about ingraining it in the process. So the goal is to have salespeople have a reason to be in the system all day long, at a minimum once a day. Um, I see implementations, I don't want to say fail, they don't fail, like the system's being used, but not be as successful as they could be when salespeople are logging in maybe once a week because the data updates are due or to pull a report or be logging in like less frequently than that. And so the goal is really constant usage in there at least once a day. And you can take a look at the sticker, the carrot approach, but I, I really think that it's best to just ingrain it in the sales process so that they don't have a choice about it. Um, I've seen this work well at a few different organizations. So a couple kind of ideas, and obviously people's processes might be different, but a couple ideas of how you can ingrain it are um, like if you're doing quotes or statements of works or estimates for, you know, for your sales process to ingrain that within the system. So maybe, maybe they need to get the quote approved or the statement of work approved. That approval process could go through CE. 
Um, if you need to pull in additional resources, like I know when Merlin and I used to work together, I couldn't get a pre-sales resource unless I had enough information filled out in our CE system. So I needed a pre-sales resource to do the demo, to do the quote for me. And so it forced me to fill out information and maybe gather more than I would have, you know, if that wasn't a requirement. Um, some other ways to ingrain it into the system is like you could send out contracts or documents from it, quotes, um, if you have like master services agreements, anything like that, any sort of contract. And I know Merlin's going to talk some about that in his section and what type of functionality we have that where you can utilize that and ingrain that in part of the process. And then the last thing that I think that works the best is to tie it to their compensation. And so if you calculate commissions off your CRM or CE data, um, or say, you know, like if it's not in there, it doesn't count. Like we're not going to pay you commission on a deal that's one unless it's closed as one in CE. That is really the best way to get salespeople using it because that is honestly what they care about the most. So a couple of other notes um, is that I highly encourage uh, managers to use it as well. And so if you have like a sales team meeting or one-on-ones, the managers should really be pulling it up. They should really have a dashboard. They should really be talking through what they see in CE. So nothing hurts adoption more when the manager doesn't log into the system or the manager is keeping notes somewhere else, you know, paper, OneNote, Excel, and working off of that instead of the CE data. If the salesperson sees the manager not using it or that they don't care about it or they're, yeah, they're just not in there, they, they're not going to use it. Um, and so really getting all the managers involved on board and using it just as much as the salespeople are. And then my last point I'd like to make is just about dashboards. And so dashboards just really help. An effective dashboard really helps. So if you can give the salesperson everything they need in one spot, um, you know, whatever core records they work with on the most regular basis. So maybe it's their leads, opportunities, activities, things like that you know, just in one spot where they don't have to go digging through the system, just simplifying that for them is going to help them use it more effectively. And same with managers. And so it's good to have an individual dashboard and a manager dashboard so that both types of roles can easily access the data they need. I don't know if I have a question, but Liz, I think one of the things that you really touched on here is that if they're not already using the system today, when you go to try to implement something new, it's not going to be helpful because they're so behind on like what's currently in the system for them to use. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that that was an important point that you that you brought up, because if they're not doing these things or if they're not in the system with their managers, you could add all the new features in the world and it's not going to make a difference. It's not. No, no. You really have to get these foundational things down first. Um, otherwise, all the cool stuff that Merlin talks about next won't add value. Yeah, so the, the foundational stuff is is really important. Um, and there's other, there's foundational kind of technical features, I guess, that I want to talk about too. So like the Outlook uh, integration is very helpful for salespeople. So syncing emails and activities, um, the mobile app, um, there's offline functionality, like that is super helpful for a salesperson, like a field rep that's out you know, traveling and maybe places that don't have internet connection. Um, also another like technical feature that I really think helps sales teams are the editable grids. And so, you know, it's really annoying to have to open up your individual lead or opportunity records to update the data. Well, the editable grid acts like a spreadsheet where you can just quickly enter the data. We've had them for a number of years, um, but this release wave that's coming out this spring is actually enhancing them. And so there's a couple of things I wanted to call out. Like you are going to be able to like filter, sort, search, and reorder the data and hide columns um, and add columns to the grid and do aggregations. And so those are new things that we haven't had in the past that are supposed to come out in June. But either way, I think editable grids are helpful for a salesperson that needs to do a lot of data entry and updating on their opportunity and lead records. I think that's such a, like, I, 
you've made a lot of great points here, but that one, I, whenever I talk to like technical people or consultants, they hate the editable grids because it just makes everything look weird. And like, they're not a fan of it. And I've, every technical person I've ever talked to is like, no, turn them off. Like you can't do this and this, but it's actually like, it, they're not bad. Um, they do work like your calculate calculated and roll up fields will still work. If you, mm-hmm. uh, implement editable grids and business sales rules still work them. too. Like you can yeah. still dynamically like request a field so it's nice that your business rules still work but I know technical people hate them um but as <laughs> like speaking from my time as an account manager they were a game changer like we we you couldn't keep your stuff up to date easily enough like it's just so much more time to have to click open each record now I guess you could argue like that little preview pane we have now on the left helps you kind of you don't have to go back to the view you can just go to the next record but I still think that added a little grid is super helpful from a salesperson perspective. That also speaks to the bulk edit. I mean, I've had that Mm -hmm. happen just recently where a salesperson, that sounds so basic to us, right? We've been able to bulk edit records for 10 years, but to a salesperson, they have no idea. And they're kind of scared to press on anything they don't, they don't know. So I showed a salesperson this week that he could bulk edit, you know, his estimated close dates or something, you know, because he had four opportunities for the same account. And I was like, hey, you can just click them all and update it. And I mean, he was overjoyed. See, I, can't... I don't like showing salespeople how to do that because when their estimated close dates go in the past, you just bulk select them all and push them out. And you don't actually put the estimated close date that it is accurate because <laughs> I know I've done that and I've seen people do that. <laughs> yeah, so we have multiple dates on our opportunity. So I showed them a different one, but it is okay. an example. You know what I mean? So it's, but, it, but you can find use cases for it. Yes. Um, Yes, I could definitely see how a bulk edit could be useful, just not for the estimated close date for that scenario. (laughs) I agree with all of those points. Uh, And I'm actually going to jump off of some of these into my own section. Um, I, my, my favorite anecdote about your second to last point, Liz, about getting, making sure that the managers are using it as well as the users is uh, I once implemented for a customer and like, I don't know, six, eight months after implementation, like nobody was using, uh, nobody on the sales team was really using CRM. They weren't keeping their data up to date. And at the time, once once we dug into it a little bit, we found out that the VP of sales had never logged into the system and was asking all of his salespeople to put together a spreadsheet of data every week and send it to him for his review. And so, of course, the salespeople are going to update the spreadsheet and they're never going to update the CRM system because their boss was never looking there. And I feel like that's like number one way to like throw away your investment in a software application is have the boss ignore it. Yeah, or have I've seen bosses, executives say like, I, I hate this, don't use it. <laughs> like your salespeople are not going to use it then. Like you have to have executive sponsorship and you have to have the executives and managers, executives that are applicable and the sales managers involved in using it. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So then I'm going to jump into uh, talking about some of the advanced features. So uh, if you are someone who sympathizes with the problems that Ashley brought up uh, and is in the process maybe of going through some of the solutions that Liz brought up, um, you may be thinking to yourself, well, there's nothing that I can do until I fix all of the problems that I have. And I want to say that I don't think that that's necessarily the case. Um, So I chose some features specifically uh, a bunch of these where you can drop these in and get some value add and not actually have to change anything else about the way that you're using your system, ideally. Now, of course, you'll always get some extra benefit as long as you do fix some of those core issues. And some of the things um, that I'll talk about obviously depend on some of that, but you can still get some value add in here um, with a bunch of this stuff. So uh, starting with Um, the sales insights. So you'll see those are in two different colors. The ones that are in red are the ones that come for free. The ones that are in green, uh, that's not an exhaustive list, uh, but those are the ones that come with the additional paid license for sales insights, the premium sales insights. Um, And a lot of those green ones, you'll notice like relationship analytics and who knows whom. Um, Some of those things will rely on just exchange data. So you don't necessarily have to be tracking your emails and activities and dynamics. Um, but it certainly helps if you are. Uh, Some of the other ones, like the predictive lead and opportunity scoring, um, 
you're really only going to see value from those if you do have sales users actually tracking their activities, tracking phone calls and emails and um, the things that they're doing. Um, because otherwise, the scoring model isn't going to have really that much to work with. Um, and kind of similarly with the forecasting, um, again, the more data that you have, the better and the more accurate that those things can be. But the free features can still be value add, and you don't necessarily need to do that much um, to get that value. So the assistant, um, that's the new newer uh, little cards that pop up in the interface. It used to be called the relationship assistant. Now it's just the assistant. Um, some of those cards obviously do depend on activities. So you can have like a reminder card that says, well, you haven't reached out to this opportunity in a week. Maybe you'd like to follow up with them. Um, that's something where obviously the system isn't going to know if you followed up, if you're not tracking an email or some other activity against that opportunity. Um, but some of the other features, uh, like the auto capture, um, actually helps to inform the activities that you're tracking. So that auto capture feature is the one where it looks in your mailbox and looks for emails that it thinks maybe you'd like to track. And it actually surfaces those when you're looking within Dynamics. So if I'm looking at a contact or an account or an opportunity and I have an email that the system thinks might be relevant to that record, it will show it in the timeline but it will, it will note to you that this information is only available to you until you track it. And so what that lets you do is say, oh yes, actually this email is relevant to this opportunity. And then you can just click the button there on the opportunity and it'll track it up for you instead of thinking to yourself, oh, I have this email, go back to Outlook, find the email, uh, click the Dynamics button, navigate to the opportunity, set regarding, all that stuff. Um, so it makes it a lot easier to sort of get people to start tracking things into the system, which then, again, have that downstream effect on the other features. Um, and the email engagement kind of gives you uh, additional um, information along those lines. That's the feature where you can see if somebody has opened or looked at the email that you sent to them. Um, that may be less relevant if you're emailing exclusively out of Outlook and not really using the Dynamics emailing capabilities. Um, but it still is another way where you can kind of build that activity flow and get some of those activity analytics uh, into the system. Um, so that's the sales insight stuff. I think there's a lot of stuff that you can turn on there um, that will be uh, very value add without having to do much else. Um, another area to talk about uh, is Power BI and embedding Power BI components within Dynamics. So this kind of ties back to um, Liz's last solution point, which was having good dashboards. And I feel like you can make a decent dashboard with the charts and the things that you can get out of Dynamics. But if you put Power BI in there, you can get so much more and it will look so much better. And you can actually interact with the data in a lot more ways. Um, and having that Power BI dashboard embedded just like a native dashboard in Dynamics can give a lot more value, especially to kind of that management level tier um, so that they can get a lot better information and analytics that way. Um, you can also, uh, in case you didn't know, you can uh, take a single little chart or uh, widget out of a Power BI report and embed that actually on uh, a form within Dynamics. So you could have on your account form, you could have a lifetime spend chart uh, or a last five opportunities value chart. And you can just put that little chart right on there and embed it right on the page uh, and make it look real nice. Get your users super excited about it. Another feature, uh, and, and Liz mentioned this one as well, is talking about the document generation. Um, so a couple of years ago, I guess at this point, um, Microsoft added this sort of document generation as I would say the, the, next, the next evolution past mail merge um, and sort of replacing some of the, the SQL reporting capabilities where you can do um, one-click document generation and it actually happens uh, on the server side instead of like a mail merge happening on the on the client side where you have to like click through the things in Word. Um, with the document generation, you set up a Word or Excel uh, document and you say, all right, I want to execute this as a report basically on this record. Um, and the system delivers to you a Word document with all the data in it or the Excel document with all the data in it. Um, and I made a note here about the PDF stuff. Um, so apparently you can now actually generate PDFs out of Dynamics. Uh, that's either out or coming soon, um, which is pretty exciting. That gives you yet another capability. Um, 
and kind of feeding back into the point that Liz was making about um, getting users into the system and getting it sort of part of their uh, their daily existence is if you are generating these documents out of the dynamic system for customer deliverables, or if you are generating them out of dynamics and then feeding them into like an e-signature platform so that you can send those things directly out to customers um, and have them sign them and return them right back. And it all shows back up in the dynamics platform, um, making it so that the salespeople do things that way will make it a lot easier for them and a lot simpler for them to sort of involve dynamics in the in their day-to-day -day, uh, work. Um, I also wanted to comment on the LinkedIn integration. Um, in case you haven't looked at the LinkedIn integration since it first came out, a lot of uh, additional and valuable features that it did not have at launch. So at launch, it was basically just a view into LinkedIn from a record in Dynamics. Um, now that integration actually lets you pass data back and forth um, and do a lot of additional stuff. Um, so definitely consider looking into that. Uh, and I did add the OneNote integration on here, even though I'm not really that big of a fan of it. Uh, Ashley talked me into it because she said there is value in the OneNote integration. Um, it allows you to create a OneNote notebook for every record that you want to in your dynamic system. And I don't like that because it's an individual notebook for every single record. And I mostly use OneNote in my desktop client. And I don't want to have 50 different notebooks open. I want to have one notebook, maybe with different tabs. And of course, that integration can't really do that. Um, but I could imagine, with Ashley's help, a use case wherein having that OneNote integration uh, could be valuable or useful. Um, but again, that's just a feature that you can turn on. And if it helps, great. And if it doesn't, that's fine. Uh, the last thing that I added was the mobile app. And originally, I didn't actually have that on this list. Uh, and I ended up adding it because the three of us actually were talking the other day about some of the new features that are planned for the mobile app. And one of the things on that roadmap is phone call transcription for phone calls that you have made through the Dynamics mobile app. Um, and I feel like that's a great reminder that Microsoft is making a lot of improvements and has made a lot of improvements to the Dynamics mobile app over the last few years. Um, and so if your salespeople aren't using it, um, because maybe they tried it in the past and it was kind of garbage, um, I would strongly, strongly encourage you to take a look at that app again um, because it, it, it keeps getting better and you may now finally be at the point where the salespeople will be excited to use it uh, and then that's just another mechanism for them to get to their data. The faster that they can get to their data, the more up-to-date they can keep it, the more up-to-date that they keep it, the better your system is overall and everybody wins, right? Ashley, did you want to add anything to my OneNote integration comment? <laughs> it just always makes me laugh when you talk about the OneNote integration because I do, like, I think it's one of those things where there's obvious benefit, but there are some maybe changes to the way that you work um, that you have to, to do in order to use it fully. Like, our salespeople did have to change the way that they work in order to to use it to its full potential, but they saw so much value in the fact that they could, you know, transfer notes back and forth between their sales support people without sending an email. Um, we've actually seen a reduction in emails and meetings being sent or, you know, posted because they could just post notes right into that one note. And then everyone that has access to that account has access to those notes. So for us, it was more of a time saver overall made them a little bit more efficient, um, although nobody loved the all the notebooks. <laughs> I guess that's a fair point. And if it's reducing emails, and clearly it's it's doing what it should be doing. But I don't want to change the way that I work, Ashley. I want to work <laughs> my way. You are a salesperson, Marilyn. <laughs> <laughs> kind of true. Um, I would say a couple other things that you mentioned in your um, section, which is awesome, because these are all things that you could implement, I mean, immediately um, and take advantage of. Um, the one thing that's great about the assistant is, um, you know, you have your out of the box features with it that come free, but you can, if you do have the premium uh, sales insights, you can actually add custom cards. Um, and I've seen that be really beneficial, you know, especially if you are using like an XRM um, type of system, or if you have just additional things like on your opportunity, like we are talking additional date fields, um, right now out of the box, it only works with the estimated close date, but you could add those custom cards in. Merlin, you didn't talk about my things I was excited about for email engagement. 
Which things? The scheduling emails. You can write an email and schedule it to send at the optimal time, taking time zone into consideration if Big Maps is turned on, which I got real <laughs> excited about. Also, that it tells you the effectiveness of your templates if you're using email templates. And also, the email template designer has been improved, just as a side note, which is also very exciting. Yep, those are all good points. I also, I want to talk a little bit more about the mobile app because I've seen too many sales teams that don't have the mobile app deployed. It's super easy. It's free. It takes basically no setup. And if you haven't looked at it since it's changed to the unified interface, you absolutely need to look at it and consider deploying it. Like I think it's one of the biggest things you can do to impact adoption that's, you know, easy and free. And that's such a good point. I actually rolled it out at my current company um, in 2020, which people are like, well, why do we need a mobile app? We're not out in the field. We're all stuck at home. Um, but they actually found benefit at it, like with it from home, because it for a lot of people, it tended to be a little bit more responsive. Um, the, the, you know, the forms would come up more quickly. Um, they could be doing something on their desktop, but then also have their phone in hand if like they needed to look up something really quick. It just gave them more accessibility. Um, so even in a time when people are, salespeople might not be on the road as often, I've seen it add a ton of value. Yeah, we're everyone's on their phone all day long. Like you have it all day. So it makes sense that if you think of like, oh, I need to update something in CE instead of having to like go to it in a browser and change what you're doing on your computer, you can just pull up your phone and do it right there. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that makes they love the talk to text feature as well, that they can just talk their notes in rather than having to sit there and type them all out. Yeah, that's a good one to call out. People get really excited about that. I guess I want to point out for document generation that it's another thing. Like if you're generating any sort of kind of recurring, repeatable document, um, agreements, contracts, deliverables, you should really look at the Word and Excel templates. Um, I've not personally used the PDF one. Um, but again, they're there. They're easy to set up. Now, if you want e-signatures, those don't do it. And there's plenty of third-party e-sign add-ons and those obviously come with an additional cost but at the very least look at using the out of the box word and excel templates like i really think that they're an underutilized feature as well and it keeps you always on the most current version of something like you don't have to worry that the mm -hmm. salesperson is updating this local copy that they used for their last customer six months ago but the templates changed and they didn't pay attention Mm -hmm. so, well, and if you're copy and pasting data and like the customer name and their address and then a number, like you can just have all that autofill, like it's just yeah. a time saver. And I've actually found the Excel templates to be a great, a great workaround to ex uh, exporting into Excel directly, because then you can control what data that they're able to export. Um, so I've used that a lot of a lot of ways, too. That's a good point. Yeah, so actually your point is like if you've turned off the like where salespeople can't export to Excel, you can still build them an Excel template. That's yep. a great And then you can control yeah. which entities or tables they can export instead of allowing like a free for all. Um, all right. We have a long, long list of additional resources, um, starting with uh, this really excellent podcast that just started recently that has three excellent hosts. Um, we don't need to name them, but uh, you've been listening to them thus far. Um, we've got uh, a link to a blog that I'm contributing to on a fairly regular basis, um, and then a bunch of other uh, useful documentation, um, other blogs. Uh, just as an aside, that CRM chart guide does some very amazing things with the out-of-the-box charts. So if you're not already familiar with his stuff, you should definitely check it out. Um, but a whole bunch of additional resources there. Um, and so thanks everybody for watching. All right. Hello folks. It's time for Q and a, uh, does anyone have any questions? I know that, uh, with the connection problems there, it appears that we missed at least five minutes of my hilarious anecdote and no doubt a uh, wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, but I don't know that you actually missed anything that important. So um, I think Hugh pointed out that probably the answer to the story was 
the sales VP was not using Dynamics and he in fact was not. I don't think he'd ever logged in. He's doing all of his reports in Excel. So yes, that was the end of the story. I know, very exciting. Uh, does anyone have any questions? I haven't seen any in the Q&A. While I wait for questions, I'm going to prompt uh, Ashley for her topic of the hour. Yeah, well, first of all, I just want to say like thanks everyone for hanging in with us uh, while we had um, some technical issues during our session. So uh, you guys have a better attention span than I do if you stayed on. Um, so I guess like the things that I just want to talk about is, you know, I said that we're at my company talk, you know, using the um, the assistant is notifications. Um, notifications are coming out obviously in this ne next release, I think sometime this summer. Um, but it's also just about being creative about how you guys use these things. So I know that we had talked about that, Liz and Marlon. Have you guys seen a different kind of way to use some of these sales insight features? Not typical? Mm, I don't know about anything that's not that typical, no. Honestly, I haven't seen the sales insight features used that often. Um, but I also haven't been that directly involved in projects for a little while either. So, yeah, same. Like I, I think that's kind of what led us to want to speak on this is that I see very few clients actually get to the point of deploying them, <laughs> but they, I think they should add value. Yes. Yeah. So we launched the assist or the assistant just recently, and the next one was because of this presentation. I was inspired to do the email engagement. Because I was like, they're all here. We got to use these. I mean, we're already paying for them in our licensing. Like, why would we not use them? Right. Yeah. Liz, um, what about you? Yeah. Or did anybody have any questions? I'm not seeing any come in, like Marilyn said. Um, I do. I, I, Debbie, I did appreciate your comment about using Teams uh, potentially instead of OneNote. I think I would probably like that more than using the OneNote integration. Um, so, yeah. Teams, also a good choice. Liz? Yeah, the thing I guess I wanted to comment on um, was also related to email engagement. Um, so recently, I discovered the enhanced um, email for timeline setting in the settings area. And so I've been playing around with that. Um, and if you haven't checked it out, what it is, is it basically um, puts it like, pops out your email in the bottom right hand side of your screen. And so then it stays there as you move around the system. Um, and I guess like the intention is to make emailing out of CE easier. Um, and obviously that's, you know, a challenge to get people to switch because everyone's just so used to Outlook. Um, so yeah, just wanted to call that out. And I guess if Ashley, Merlin, you have any thoughts on it, or if anyone from the audience does feel free to chat, if you're using it or have questions, like, We'd love to to hear if it if you've made the switch to emailing out of CE and if that helped. I think that's hard, the hardest part of a lot of this is that it's going to be changing the way that your salespeople work, and salespeople don't take kindly to that a lot of times. So I think it's showing the value um, and having to prove like, okay, added this one small piece and then continue to grow on it rather than implementing everything at one time. Mm -hmm. Um, Leslie had a note that they implemented the notes analysis and had to turn it off because it was causing an API error. I guess, I'm not sure what that's about. That sounds somewhat problematic. I'd love to know more about that though, Leslie, sometime. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't sound good. Um, and John was wondering if we had any problems <clears throat> with the offline capability in the mobile app. Um, have either of you encountered the mobile app in an offline scenario recently? Not recently. <laughs> Not I haven't. Then. Yeah, I haven't recently, but I will be in the next next month or two here. So I'll let you know if I do run into issues. <laughs> I have to deploy it for my my project before June. So yeah, we don't have it enabled for offline right now. But when the mobile app first got released, I mean, obviously it's hard to like compare what it was three, four years ago to what it is today. We actually, the biggest problem we had with the offline is that people would meet offline. So they couldn't, it, it was an odd issue. I hope things like that are resolved. I haven't used it in a long time. Yeah, and I know it didn't It didn't work for a number of years, um, but that, you know, I want to say two years ago, it, last I checked, it was working just fine. Right, and that's what I'm curious about as well. I haven't used it 
in the in the latest iteration to know how much better uh, it is. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Mark is wondering about have you seen use of customer insights? Have either of you used customer insights? Have you Merlin, that's all you. I know that's your topic. <laughs> Uh, I actually just, uh, I have a webinar coming up on customer insights tomorrow, but um, <clears throat> I will admit that I have not seen customer insights that much in use in production scenarios, but I think, I don't think that's because the product isn't good. I think that's because maybe people haven't yet realized how useful customer insights can be. Um, and I think, in a, at least in a lot of sort of legacy dynamics customers, They've already gone through a lot of work to build integration between their ERP system and their CRM system. And they're already kind of like pulling a lot of data into CRM probably so that they can do marketing and reporting off of it. And that's kind of what customer insights is designed for um, is to give you that better reporting capability. I think the, the white space for it is if you have other systems that aren't already integrated, um, or if you're not already doing that sort of like mass level of integration or you don't want to have all your data sitting in your CRM platform to do that, uh, Customer Insights gives you a great place to do that aggregation and then just like natively plug it into a bunch of other cool AI stuff. Um, so it's a really cool product. Uh, I'm a big fan. I just don't know that that many customers are actually using it yet because I don't, like I said, I don't think that they've, I don't think they've seen the benefit yet and it's not exactly cheap. So. Um, can you describe what portions of sales insights is very useful? I think that's one of the parts of your section, Merlin, that maybe got cut out by the interruption. Probably. <laughs> I don't know if you want to comment on that, but I'm sure Liz and I have additions as well. Um, uh, I don't have the slide in front of me, so now I don't even remember what it was that I was talking about in that section. Um, there's... So yeah, go ahead, Ashley. No, go ahead, Marilyn. No, I know you have some thoughts on this, but please. <laughs> So, so, okay, so there's obviously the two different kinds of insights. You have like the standard that come with your CE licensing, but then there's also the premium. Um, so inside of the standard, you know, Liz is really passionate about the email engagement. Um, I think we did hear that without the interruption. Um, I also really like the assistant because there was no such thing as a notification. Um, like I said, that is now changing in June. Um, so that's pretty exciting um, to see come. Um, for the premium ones, um, I know I've really, always looked at the forecasting since it came out because that's going to be one way to push salespeople to automatically use the system is that if you put all of their forecasting you can take it out of a spreadsheet and put it into the system they're making a lot of changes to the forecasting um it's getting it's only getting better so i like that one a lot liz what about you on the premium side are there anything yeah well i i just have to plug our podcast we have a whole episode on sales insights but my answer who asked that terry to terry would be i need to know more about your business because you know you don't want to deploy all of them at once and i think it really does depend on your process so i like to give the typical consulting answer but it depends <laughs> but i like email engagement i like auto capture for the free ones um and i'll i'll echo what ashley said about the the cards the the notifications because i think that's such a big improvement over sending like an email notification mm -hmm. it's true um, I also really like the auto capture just because I think it makes it easier for users to track emails because it'll show you the emails that they ought to track maybe and give them the option to track them from the, the dynamic side as opposed to them having to go back to Outlook and then find the regarding and do all that. So I think um, that's one of my favorites and it's one of the free ones. And auto capture does not put the email inside CE until you track it. That's right. That's a common... It's not actually there. Concern. <laughs> no. <laughs> right. Um, and Paula asked if a sent email still shows up in your sent email in Outlook. And he was already answered and said that, yes, it does. Um, so that's great news. Yeah, thank, thank you, you Hugh. Uh, Leslie says her support ticket is still open. OK, that makes sense. Um, and Chad. Uh, agrees that the email engagement click links is an underrated feature. Hmm. Uh, the sent email thing, it might depend on your mailbox setting though. Just to call that out. I don't know if it, it 
wouldn't happen for server side sync, I wouldn't think. But I would say if it's not working like that, check your mailbox settings. That's probably true. Um, all right, are there any other questions that anybody has? Feel free to put them in the chat. Um, my last plug is actually going to be for our podcast. So I snuck our logo into the beginning of the presentation. Uh, we do a podcast every week called Dynamics Hot Dish, dynamicshotdish.com, or everywhere that your podcasts are. Feel free to come in, listen to us every week, talk about inane things and then also useful things. <laughs> the inane things only take up a small portion at the beginning of the podcast. And thanks Probably for... The most I want to say thanks for attending Dynamics Con too, and we're happy to have everyone here watching. Yeah, big thank you to Dynamics Con for putting this on and having this kind of event for us. It's awesome. Yes, and especially thanks for cutting out that portion of my presentation. I didn't want to, anybody to see anybody. <laughs> awesome. Last well, couple questions. Everyone. I see nothing. Okay. Thanks, everybody.